Leon, I don't know you. I don't know you personally, but it's a real pleasure to um, have you as part of this Thanks. series, and we're all looking forward to hearing about your work. As people will know from reading um, the flyer, that P uh, Leon is a PhD student um, at the moment and getting near to the end of his PhD. And I think his question, his question is a really fascinating one about why New Zealand educationalists or the education sector have not fallen prey to neoliberal reforms quite as much as the as they have elsewhere which is kind of interesting and it's encouraging to us to hear that I guess because yeah. all we see here is how gruesome it is and it's <laughs> nice to be reminded that it might be more gruesome elsewhere not that we want that <laughs> for people um, so yeah and Leon's in communication journalism marketing a big grab bag department that one at Massey and um, Today he's going to talk to us about some of the theoretical work, I think, from his PhD and, um, and the kind of nexus between politics and ethics effect and subjectivity and trying to make sense of um, this issue that he's, he's in, investigating. So I'll hand it over to you, Leon, so that we can um, yes. most of our time we have left. So welcome. Thanks, Thanks overall for the introduction. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I came to New Zealand in 2011 as a complete outsider to, to New Zealand and education, or like my public as a teacher. I really got interested in, well, it was around the time of 2013 when uh, NZDI were doing a big campaign against what they called the germ, the global education reform movement. So basically, um, I got interested in how there was this kind of disjoint between what people in education seem to believe in what was right the right um, philosophy for education and um, what seems to be the common kind of dominant discourse coming from the policy end and from the government and uh, uh, also uh, being from the UK um, I also seen how, how how far had gone this kind of neoliberal reform agenda had gone over there and it's like the kind of the unions were pretty in disarray they don't that there didn't seem to be much uh, much organised resistance to what was going on, but and then uh, obviously I came over here, and it just seemed to be a lot more a, lo a, a very different atmosphere, and there seemed to be a belief that there could something could be done about this uh, this kind of policy agenda. So um, I, I, I got interested in investigating why, uh, but obviously I am. Although I've after I'm in kind of two and a half years through my PhD now, I'm, I, I, I'm kind of uh, and I've done my interviews. I kind of I'm a semi insider but i'm also still an outsider uh, and i'm still very much going through this is um what i'm talking about today is focusing on the third analysis chapter of my thesis um the first analysis chapter is like a policy analysis um, looking at selective texts going back um to the start of um neoliberalism really like the 1984 kind of Rogernomics reforms, and then the second analysis chapter is um, kind of looking at this, a specific period, which is when after National came into power, which is looking at the interactions with the media realm, uh, and then this is more focused on my third analysis chapter, which is interviews with um, activists or education activists. So I'll um, I'll crack on. Uh, so um, by defines instrumentalism as um, a mode of perception and interaction wherein entities are valued not for what they are in themselves, but primarily or only for their utility to the self. So she's referring really here to a philosophy which has been dominant in the West right back to the subject object dualism of Descartes. Since that split, we perceived ourselves as separate from the natural world, acting on it, seeing it as a means to an end rather than being a part of it. And while this has enabled the industrial and scientific revolutions, it's recently become problematic as we now seem unable to cope with the anthropomorphic climate change and other societal symptoms, alienation, depression, obesity, etc. And when this instrumentalist mode of perception is applied to education, it becomes narrowed to a means to an end rather than an end to itself. And the people involved in it, teachers and students, tend to become viewed as objects rather than subjects. And closely linked to this um, instrumentalism is the logical performativity, 
Leotard identified this as the increasingly dominant mode of scientific knowledge production. Uh, because of the production of scientific proof, you need a lot of money, e.g. A, a laboratory with expensive equipment. The goal thus becomes increasing the efficiency of this proof production through decreasing inputs and increasing outputs, rather than that of attaining higher truths for their own sake. And then, then this often leads to the metaphor of the machine uh, when applied in education policy discourse. So rather than think about education as an organic and open process, we think and talk about an education system with gears which can be engaged and levers which can be pulled to achieve specific objectives. And so I argue that this performativity logic combines with an accelerates and instrumentalist view of education, where the purpose or goal of education becomes to act upon an objective rarefied system as a means in order to reach the specific ends of increased economic growth and competitiveness. And Foucault observed in his Birth of Biopolitics lectures that the central subject position of neoliberalism is the entrepreneurial self. Liberalism's homo economicus redefined as an entrepreneur of him or herself. And this stems from the metaphor of human beings as ability machines that produce an earning stream instead of investing in factories which contain, for example, weaving machinery, the object of investment in neoliberal capitalism is us. Human capital or individual enterprise units, which must be shaped into wanting to invest in ourselves in order to increase our capital value. By quoting Foucault, making what are called educational investments. Then thus, so thus all public policy, not only education, but health, welfare become a formula for what will or will not improve our stock of human capital. But education in particular increases in importance as the economic driver of neoliberal capitalism. In equipping subjects to be sufficiently adaptable and flexible for the increasingly uncertain demands of the market. And we can add further to this by adding perspectives from the Lacanian psychoanalytic tradition. From this perspective, the entrepreneurial self is not only a stable subject position resulting from the political rationality, which acts on us externally, but also acts on us internally by structuring our desire. For Lacan, of course, we are defined by lack. We are never a whole subject. We look to the other or the discourse of society to tell us who we are. So we identify towards or desire figures such as Steve Jobs because they are authoritative, sanctioned by the discourse of society, and they offer us a stabilizing point of identification to reach towards but also project ourselves into. Through our effective investment, we raise them to the position of the sublime object, the object of desire, which is always just beyond our reach, because as Jones and Spicer point out here, it is the very unattainability which makes us reach towards it and thus identify with it. And because they become a part of our identities, critique of them becomes an attack on us. Um, so the context of my research is uh, just under three decades of the neoliberalization of school sector education. I use Jamie Peck's term here, neoliberalization, to refer to an active process rather than the monolithic big N. He uses the metaphorical language of the sea when he refers to flows and backflows and undercurrents, which take quite different forms over time and they connect to other ideological currents. In my first analysis chapter, I look at the first three periods through a policy analysis of selected texts and speeches. And this, this, the, uh, my second analysis chapter looks at that fourth period, 2008 to 2013, in more detail. And so for that first period, defined, by, um, which can be called Rogernomics, I looked at two treasury briefings uh, to the incoming government, 84 and 87. And the 87 report had a whole section on education, the social democratic principles, the position debt as a universal and eternal right and a public good, which leads to an informed citizenship and healthy de democracy, were repositioned as serving the distinct societal requirements of that uh, specific post-war period. Um, in the report, the model was positioned as out of date and ill-suited for the modern requirement for that maximization of human capital. 
But in order to achieve this repositioning, education had to be reconceived as a performative system. E.g. as Leotard stated, its ultimate goal became not education itself, as it um, was, was uh, but efficiency. It had to show value for money through increased outputs and decreased inputs. <clears throat> E.g. values from economics, not from education. And so a utopian vision of a leaner, more efficient and a, an accountable system comes contrasted to the current bureaucratic, unresponsive, unwieldy and over-centralised system, which constrains the emergence of entrepreneurial selves. But there is an inherent tension in this utopian vision, which runs right through the later periods. In order to engineer this emergence of free entrepreneurs, there is a requirement to ensure that the system becomes hierarchical, responsive, and accountable to performance measures. So the system is simultaneously over-centralized, but also under-centralized. And in the second period of P the PICO report, and in particular the Sexton report, outline the responsibilities as well as the rights of the entrepreneurial parent. The relationship between teachers and parents becomes defined through the audit relation, with parents assigned the task of performance managing teachers. And then you've got the uh, late uh, early 2000s through to 2007, after Labour coming to power in 1990, see the emergence of a third world, uh, third way discourse, with a normalisation of the human capital requirement through rearticulations of elements of social democracy. You get again talk of good, good citizenship, diversity, New Zealand's bicultural uh, culture. The parent-teacher audit relation is backgrounded, while the, the teacher-student relation foregrounded is a concentration on the requirement of teachers to enable students to equip themselves with the skills necessary to cope in a world marked by rapid technological change and globalisation. In other words, to become entrepreneurial students. And so where you could see the Labour third way period as a pushing back against neoliberalism, you could also see it as a normalisation period for many of the assumptions and a broadening out of the entrepreneurial self as a model for all areas of life and all relationships, but just through a less antagonistic discourse. And the fourth period, 2008 to 13, the current national government re-foregrounded the parent-teacher audit relation through national standards and a fixation on measurement and achievement data, stratifying and comparing children as young as five in order to avoid the danger that they will grow up as unentrepreneurial and thus a drain on the state. Um, so as an undercurrent, New Zealand also has a strong tradition of teaching practice, variously termed holistic, creative or progressive education. Within this tradition, the goal of education is about harnessing and releasing the creative potential in children by allowing them to make mistakes encouraging them to make discoveries themselves, giving them time to go into things in depth, guiding them to take inspiration from their natural environment, etc. And this tradition has its origins back in the early 20th century, when the writers of thinkers such as Dewey and Rousseau became influential. The 1929 syllabus defined children as not an empty vessel, but as a soul, a personality capable of being developed and trained for the wider service of humanity. And then you have Clarence Beebe as a director of education in the 40s and 50s with his famous speech in 39 where he said every child has a right to a free education to the fullest extent of their powers. So the holistic really from the start was intertwined with the values and principles of social democracy. It wasn't just about releasing creativity for its own sake, but that creativity was good for humanity, for a healthy democracy. And this wasn't just coming down from above. Preschool teachers or mistresses, as they were called then, found in the 50s that you couldn't make younger children sit and listen to a teacher all day in the traditional style. You had to make it child-centred or you just wouldn't engage them. And Alwyn Richardson's influential book, In the Early World, based on his time as a teacher at Arurati, a pretty remote community in Northland between uh, 1949 and 62, and he was allowed there by the ministry to develop an environmental philosophy of education which abandoned subject, uh, separate subject lessons 
uh, imagining a re-merging of science and art with an emphasis on group autonomy and internal democratic values. Um, and then you had a, an environmental education movement in the 70s and 80s, influenced then by Richardson and the 60s progressive movement in the UK. And this is still being kept alive today, chiefly through the network on net and leading and learning blogs. Um, so we can theorize this relationship between the mainstream and that undercurrent through the work of Ernesto Leclerc. For Leclerc, the ideological discourse is the totalizing discourse of closure. Those which hegemonize the discursive terrain, providing the impression that there is no other way. Instrumentalism and performativity can thus be viewed as examples of such totalizing discourse. Through narrowing the goals and purposes of education into means end, economic imperatives and efficiencies, they leave very little space for discussion of creativity, human growth, or the joy of learning. However, that closure can never be total. As for Leclerc, there will always be an element which escapes hegemonization, a remainder or excess which cannot be fully articulated within the dominant structure, leaving open the potential for alternatives. <clears throat> oh, the, the slide's not very good, is it? Can you read that? <laughs> and it's the same for our collective identities, which for Leclerc are also never closed, influenced by Lacan's subject as lap thesis. Leclerc also sees our identities as always incomplete. And Thomason, if you can read it, a Leclercian scholar notes here, identity as a fixed and stable category becomes displaced by the process of identification. We are in a constant process of identification with discourse, which albeit can be very strong, as we're seeing with the rise of right-wing nationalism. But as I do, ideology, identifications can never be total. Fixations can only be partial and temporary. And the closed concept of dislocation, this key here, was one of my interviewees called it disappearing down the rabbit hole. We are especially open to new identifications during times of symbolic crisis, such as the GFC, or when government brings in a policy such as austerity that we can vote for. Um, so my interviews were with uh, 21 sort of outspoken prominent critics of nationals reforms, uh, including but not only um, six currently or formerly in major union roles, three um, principals, current principals, two academics and six bloggers. And they took the form of in-depth, unstructured interviews. And I mostly identified them through their online presence, but there was also some like snowballing and um, networking to uh, gather more interviewees. Um, so I had the aim of answering two research questions. To what extent do education activists draw upon social democratic principles and holistic tradition as resources for resisting neoliberal reforms? And can the work of Leclerc, supplemented by Lacan and Foucault, help to theorize that mobilization and motivation? Um, so here's some examples from the um, interview transcripts of social democratic principles. Um, these seem particularly strong and the older participants, although that's a bit of a generalization, um, such as blogs, there was such as bloggers who are education professionals, particularly those before the, those tomorrow's schools reforms in the 80s. So there's a strong belief here that there's more to education than just equipping children with skills in the most efficient way possible. It's about growing as a person through becoming able to analyze, critique, and challenge and take on democratic values, which is good for a civic society and a strong democracy. And it, these, these are some examples of more the holistic principles. While there's overlaps of social democracy, it's about growing the person, but that growth is about less about necessarily becoming analysts and critics, with more an emphasis on fun and passion. As Jane is articulating here, if you're enjoying education then you're much more likely to be engaged and to do that you have to engage the affective as well as the cognitive 
And Perry's perspective could almost be seen as delusion in that he sees human diversity, abundance and plurality as excessive, unable to be ever fully captured within the cold, calculative economic measurement of instrumentalism. And of course, it's very student-centered, articulated here by Malcolm, but that isn't necessarily introspective or about competition between individuals. It's intertwined with social democratic values. The Reggio curriculum he's describing here was devised in Italy in order to try and make sure they never have fascism again. People that think and make decisions for themselves obviously are less likely to be take, taken in by a dictator. Um, so it's clear that strong beliefs and principles are important for these activists and there's a relationship between these beliefs and the closed concept of dislocation. Uh, most of my interviews, uh, most of us were educated to believe in liberal democracy and that the state is benevolent as on our side. But when you have an experience that indicates that actually this isn't the case, this can have a strong effect on altering your identifications. And Diane here is describing how she got into blogging. She was on maternity leave when the government tried to increase class sizes in 2012. And then she did some investigation and found the figures the government was quoting were wrong. And she employs the metaphor of falling down the rabbit hole to indicate that she became immersed in a whole new world of monitoring and checking government figures and statements and blogging when she found what they were saying wasn't entirely true. And Sarah here identifies strongly as a parent, but she's also an education professional. So that when Hekia Pilata assumes the voice of parents is on the side of her government's policies, this makes her angry and motivates her blogging. And Malcolm, a school principal, did an OIA on the reasons why his school were put on a 78J, which is um, sort of an intervention normally only given to struggling schools and found out that the ministry were kind of acting a bit like the Stasi in compiling newspaper articles on him when he'd spoken out publicly against national standards. <clears throat> but this still doesn't really tell us how these strong beliefs translate into action. Leclerc is another useful concept, the ethical break, which can have some further insight. For Leclerc, the ethical is an experience of the denial of universal ideals. So signifiers such as justice, democracy, and humanity are tendentially empty because they can never be fully and completely defined. There is no stable signified to link them to because there are many different definitions of justice and democracy and humanity as there are people. Therefore, they tend to become defined through their negativity, what we feel as injustice, anti-democracy, and inhumane. McLeod adds that it's that impossibility of completely filling their meaning positively that allows them to signify the universal. Because they are empty, because they can't be represented positively through language, we can invest in them effectively with our own feelings of what we believe justice, democracy and humanity should be. And that investment allows us to universalise and elevate our daily struggles, imbuing our political action with a sense of moral rightness. And when we perceive that the current order is denying the realization of our ethical beliefs, we experience a gap between being and ought to be, leaving us to invest more heavily in objects and signifiers as names of the ethical, in particular when we see those as under attack. And we can see this in this next slide. Um, I hope you can read that all right that the New Zealand curriculum became invested in as a name of the ethical for these, eth for these interview participants. And I, only, I argue that this is only partly because of its section on student-centred learning. It also becomes a name of the ethical because national standards, conversely, becomes a symbol of the denial of ethical ideals, the denial of humanity. Um, children must fit into linear one-size-fits-all and flexible systems and the denial of democracy. So because of that investment, the curriculum becomes described by adjectives, effective adjectives such as brave, exciting, extraordinary, localised, 
um, fitted around the student, the system that we knew and loved. <clears throat> However, under the lens of the entrepreneurial self, that curriculum could actually be read quite differently. While it does talk about empowering principals and teachers to set their own local curriculum, and it does have a pedagogy section that stresses empowering students and involving them in decisions that affect their learning. However, that involvement is supposed to empower children to be positive in their own identity. And we know from Leclerc and other modern theory that our identity is actually shaped in discourse and our experiences at places like school as well as home. There is no pre-existing identity to emerge through that empowerment, positivity and energy. And the document is actually pretty prescriptive in stipulating the characteristics of the ideal student. Alongside creativity, the vision is for children to be confident, energetic, motivated, reliable, resourceful, resilient, and of course, entrepreneurial. These are the skills that will most increase our stock as human capital. <clears throat> and while this may seem I'm being a little negative about my, research, my interview respondents, Glynos, Glynos and Howarth define the ethical, also define the ethical as being attentive to the radical contingency of social relations. In other words, retaining an awareness that there are other ways of doing education and then teaching children to question the world, as many of my participants are doing, should be viewed itself as ethical. But what about the research ethics of me? Well, turning back to Foucault, while he doesn't define it as ethical, he does hint at the importance of bringing to light localised discontinu discontinuous knowledges, such as New Zealand's holistic tradition, which are often backgrounded and illegitimated as non-scientific in the mainstream discourse. He defines the practice of genealogy as <coughs> What it really does is to entertain the claims to attention of local, discontinuous, disqualified, illegitimate knowledges against the claims of a unitary body of theory, which would filter, hierarchize, and order them in the name of some true knowledge and some arbitrary idea of what constitutes the science and its objects. So the researcher, such as myself, has the potential to play a role in the reactivation of these forms of knowledge, which are often excluded by the dominant performative mode of knowledge production <clears throat> and so to conclude many of the interviewees did indeed draw on principles of social democracy and the holistic tradition to position instrumentalism as unethical and the closed concepts of dislocation and their ethical break allow us to gain a degree of understanding of the identificatory process around this as supplementing this with the lacanian process of sublimation we can also perhaps understand that there is an effective non-rational side to identification against dominant discourses and overinvestment may occur in the raising of the objects such as the curriculum to a status that is beyond critique and perhaps meaning that neoliberalism's ability to connect with and colonize discourses such as child-centered education and holistic education may go under emphasized an understanding of this process, however, shouldn't detract from the ethical importance of sustaining alternative visions for the purpose of purposes of education, both for myself and my interviewees. Thank you. Awesome.